You're at some live show, a performance of some kind. Let's say a symphony. You've been sitting, listening to the musicians work their way through the material guided by the conductor, and they have been crushing it. They arrive at the final bars, a great and exalting crescendo. And for the first time in an hour, the concert hall is silent. But not for long. Beginning with one overexcited soul, but spreading almost instantly to all corners of the room, a thunderous applause. Or, you're at some live show. Let's say, a symphony. You've been sitting, listening to the musicians work their way through the material, guided by the conductor, and they have been struggling. They arrive at the final bars, a languid, halting conclusion. And for the first time in an hour, the concert hall is silent. But not for long. Beginning with one overexcited soul, but spreading almost instantly to all corners of the room, damning jeers, hisses, and boos. In this two-part episode of Reasonably Sound, that's what we're going to be talking about. What happens at the end of a live, in-person performance. What we do to express our approval, mostly applause, that's this episode. And what we do to express our disappointment, which is often nothing. But sometimes, we boo. That's the next episode. We're going to ask, where do these things come from? Where are we allowed or expected to do them? And how do they unite or divide a group of people having a common experience. An early version of this episode was first written as a live performance for VidCon 2017 in Anaheim, California, and at the end, most people in the audience applauded. But there are lots of ways that you can show audible appreciation of some shared in-person experience. You may hoot or woo. You may whistle. If you're at a poetry reading or a jazz concert, you may snap. But I don't think it's controversial to say that, by and large, the standard bearer for audience appreciation is clapping. And there are different sorts of clap. Like, there's the sparse but loud Citizen Kane-style clap, otherwise perhaps known as the slow clap. And at the other end of the spectrum, the rather dense but quiet golf clap. These factors, volume and density, help determine the use and appropriate context of one's applause. The golf clap is quiet because concentration enabling silence is a factor in golf games, but also it's no coincidence that tiny claps seem more refined. While golf may be an extreme, fancying itself quite refined, this idea of what's refined actually pervades many norms about how and when we clap. Like, you usually don't clap in the middle of a concert, unless you're clapping along, or there's been a particularly rad solo, or in the middle of a theater performance, unless something really impressive happens. You see this in live comedy sometimes, where the stand-up goes on a particularly impassioned tirade, or finishes an extended, more performative-than-usual bit, and the audience shows appreciation for their performance by interrupting it. Generally, though, audiences hold applause for the right moments and quite a long history has led to the identification and codification of those moments. So where did applause start? It's tough to say. We've been doing it for a while, and there is something seemingly natural about having watched an amazing display and wanting to express appreciation for it using these two long things hanging at your sides to make a noise. But any sense of naturalness is probably accounted for by the fact we've all seen hundreds of thousands, if not literally millions of people do this. When they're psyched 
So to get some idea about where this starts, let's talk etymology. Applause comes from the Latin word applaudere, whose first sense is to strike one thing against another. In some Roman comedies, acts end with a clausula, or literally a little conclusion, which includes commands like plaudite, from the shortened plaudere, meaning similarly, to strike, beat, or clap. So, we know that in performance, there was an expectation of an audible reaction in some form or another, and Romans did have a few different types of applause, not just hand-smashing. They would snap, they would wave their napkins or toga ends around, which I guess is kind of like something striking against itself, or they would clap. Audience praise wasn't relegated to post-plaudite clausulas alone, though. Those were breaks in the action during which audiences could communicate back at the players, yes, but there's also evidence that those breaks weren't the only times that audiences were communicating. There's evidence that it was increasingly common for audiences to react to a work while it was happening. For instance, in Book 3 of Laws, Plato's Athenian stranger laments the poor audience manners of the day, explaining how in performing works which mix music genres, artists encourage spectators to be lawless and bold. His tirade is so good, and lots of it is going to be useful later, so I'm going to quote it at length. This is a few minutes long. The Athenian stranger says, In the first place, let us speak of the laws about music, that is to say, such music as then existed, in order that we may trace the growth of the excess of freedom from the beginning. Now, music was early divided among us into certain kinds and manners. One sort consisted of prayers to the gods, which were called hymns, and there was another and opposite sort called lamentations, and another termed paeons, and another celebrating the birth of Dionysus, called, I believe, dithyrams. And they used the actual word laws, or nomoi, for another kind of song, and to this they added the term cytheratic. All these and others were duly distinguished, nor were the performers allowed to confuse one style of music with another. And the authority, which determined and gave judgment and punished the disobedient, was not expressed in a hiss, nor in the most unmusical shouts of the multitude, as in our days, nor in applause and clapping of hands. But the directors of public instruction insisted that the spectators should listen in silence to the end. And boys and their tutors and the multitude in general were kept quiet by a hint from a stick. Such was the good order which the multitude were willing to observe. They would never have dared to give judgment by noisy cries. And then, as time went on, the poets themselves introduced the reign of vulgar and lawless innovation. They were men of genius, but they had no perception of what is just and lawful in music. Raging like bacchanals and possessed with inordinate delights, mingling lamentations with hymns and paeons with dithyrams, imitating the sounds of the flute on the lyre and making one general confusion, ignorantly affirming that music has no truth and whether good or bad can only be judged of rightly by the pleasure of the hearer. And by composing such licentious works and adding to them words as licentious, they have inspired the multitude with lawlessness and boldness and made them fancy that they can judge for themselves about melody and song. And in this way, the theaters, from being mute, have become vocal as though they had an understanding of good and bad in music and poetry. And instead of an aristocracy, an evil sort of theatocracy has grown up. 
For if the democracy, which judged, had only consisted of educated persons, no fatal harm would have been done. But in music, there first arose the universal conceit of omniscience and general lawlessness. Freedom came following afterwards, and men, fancying that they knew what they did not know, had no longer any fear. And the absence of fear begets shamelessness. For what is this shamelessness, which is so evil a thing, but the insolent refusal to regard the opinion of the better by reason of an over-daring sort of liberty. To which Megillos, a Spartan citizen conversing with the Athenian stranger as they travel the countryside on foot, responds, hm, Very true. <laughs> we'll come back to the Athenian stranger, but for now I want to point out two things to keep in mind. First, his feeling that feelings do not matter. Music is a logical art, and it's only good when it follows the rules. Encouraging people to judge such arts based on how it makes them feel versus how well it respects its own laws is a bad and slippery slope for fools that could ruin everything. How so, you might ask? That's the second point. His observation that such subjective judgments have given rise to a theatocracy. A word with two meanings. First, literally, a ruling class of theater goers, but in ancient Greek, this was also a word for government by assembly of citizens, who often did so in theaters. A threat, the stranger seems to think, to the more learned and therefore logical aristocracy, a government of nobles. All because some artists wanted to mix genres and have leers play like flutes. Was it worth it? I hope it was worth it. Civilization collapse incoming. <laughs> anyway, much, I'm sure, to the Athenian stranger's dismay, judgment by noisy cries and other unmusical sounds, including applause, during the course of a work would be the case for quite some time. Music writer Alex Ross points out that if you read the letters of Mozart, for one, they describe the concert hall as a raucous place. People hooting and hollering, clapping when so moved, shushing brazenly and erupting with ecstatic shrieks at revelatory passages. Such was reportedly the case until near the end of the Romantic period, the late 19th and early 20th century, when sensibilities began to shift. This shift leads us, eventually, to the meaning and function of applause today. To explain, we got to do a little bit of art history. Not because everything that you applaud is necessarily art, but because how a culture appreciates art often illustrates how they appreciate stuff. Just generally. <laughs> Art history. Romanticism placed value on an individual's emotions in their experience of the world. Many artworks, pieces of music, theater, paintings, sculpture, produced during the Romantic period emphasize the beauty and sublimity of nature. Individuals were expected and encouraged to experience the intense emotions thought to result from that beauty. But... As Romanticism began to give way to Modernism, that started to change. It became popular to consider audience reaction somewhat extraneous. Today, the popular understanding varies, but for the most part, we tend to think of audiences as completing artworks. By bringing their interpretations, the public initiates the final step of creation by revealing what is in the work, aspects both intended by the creator and not. With a more modernist attitude, though, works were thought to be complete before an audience ever got near them. It became popular to see works as containing only what the creator put there. Interpretations be damned. Audience members, viewers, readers of modernist works weren't expected to have feelings. They were expected to get it. 
to revel in the intellectual triumph of understanding the true statement of the work. This shift from emotion to intellect had an impact on clapping in two ways. First, audiences were expected to give the work space to be itself. Ooh, sorry. In live performance, mid-show praise became strictly verboten. The concert hall, the theater, became a place of intellectual activity as opposed to effective response. Thinking and not judgment by noisy cries. The situation was and remains slightly different when it comes to opera, but in most cases of public performance, any reaction during the course of the work came to be seen as premature, since the work isn't done making its statement. And perhaps worse, your degenerate hand smashing is distracting. So you get one chance to clap, and not hoot or holler, which is uncouth and ugly, and you get your one chance to clap at the end. Everything's over. Second, the meaning of applause also sort of changed. At one point, clapping indicated in the moment effective impact. But in the wake of modernism, and especially in the bourgeois milieu that usurped concert going from the broader public at around the turn of the 20th century, applause became more a symbol of one's appreciative prowess. To applaud no longer meant, yes, that was dope. I had feelings. Well done. But rather, hmm, indeed, you have concluded your duties, and I understand the artistic choices you have made. Now, to be clear, the transition from clap as signal of enjoyment to clap as acknowledgement of receipt was neither short, straightforward, nor total. And it didn't align perfectly with the romanticism slash modernism divide either, which is itself pretty blurry. Alex Ross again points out that as romanticism progressed, composers, for one example, began to experiment with larger multi-movement works of ever-shifting soundscapes, as opposed to the more, quote, episodic entertainment that came before, shorter, more contained pieces, one after the other. He describes this shift as introducing new kinds of continuity, which encouraged a cult of the work where composers and increasingly audiences did not appreciate interruption of those complex shifting soundscapes by lengthy bouts of appreciation or the communication of your dirty, stupid feelings. A fun anecdote that demonstrates how confusing this transition was involves Richard Wagner, composer and librettist of the world's first Gesamtkunstwerk, The Ring Cycle, and notorious enemy of applause. He went to great lengths to discourage it, and at one point his efforts worked a little better than expected. At one particular performance, people seemed hesitant to applaud, even when he thought appropriate, so hoping to provide some encouragement, Wagner himself went into the house to clap and shout bravo, and was hissed for being disrespectful. Ross writes that, alarmingly, Wagnerians were taking Wagner more seriously than he took himself. Which is to say, the lengthy negotiation between audience, event, and appropriate appreciation wasn't without miscommunication. After a while, though, the norms settled. One applauds, using usually their hands, at the end to indicate that one has received the work. You may have enjoyed it, but even if you didn't, often you clap out of a sense of duty. You fulfill your part of the contract. You acknowledge your receipt of the work by putting your hands together. So it's hard to say that applause means simply and earnestly, yay, nice work every time. Sometimes it just means, yay, it's over. And this norm spread to many facets of life. The concert hall, the theater, the workplace, even the church in some spots. Basically, anywhere you and a group of your peers receive some performative experience, it's expected that you clap when it's through, and more often than not, I bet you do. This gets us to an important point. 
Scholar Bettina brendel Risi, whose website describes her as a Professor für Theaterwissenschaft mit Schwerpunkt Performance und Gegenfachtheater, a title that is ten times cooler than any I can ever hope to possess, and one that I will fully cop to practicing multiple times before recording it, she writes that applause functions in a collective and it produces collectives. We're going to talk about that at length after a quick act break. In the Romantic period, things may have been different, but today, when applauding, you're part of a group. You can't applaud by your lonesome. You can clap, but that's not really applause. And applause creates a group of people who are, in some sense, in agreement. People around you at the show, in the office, after some display, they're clapping. And are you really going to sit there motionless? Probably not. And when you do clap, will you not realize, at least partially, the applaudability of the situation? And sure enough, studies have shown that, depending upon what's being experienced, the amount of applause after some performance can influence the perception of its quality. In one study from 2016, D. Gregory Springer and Amanda L. Schlegel, link in the show notes, detail the relationship they discovered between musical style and applause magnitude on listeners' evaluations of ensemble music performances. So what they found is that a march... ...which received no applause was rated as being less great than a march which received lots of applause. But they found the opposite was true for a ballad. Which, when met with no applause, was approved of, but when applauded tons, was rated less stellar. The authors explain that applause doesn't seem to influence appreciation of technical skill, but what they call the work's expressive slash interpretive dimensions. How the piece makes one feel, the degree to which it's thought meaningful. So maybe we find ballads more meaningful when followed by a reverent group silence, but a march more meaningful when met with collective and boisterous celebration. Which is all to say that applause and even lack thereof, doesn't just indicate agreement within a particular audience, it can also create it. This impact explains the long history of audience influence, which arguably starts in 16th century France with the claques, people hired to react to live performance in various ways, from excitedly applauding to weeping with joy, and who at one point had such a racket going that if you didn't hire them, they would show up to your performance anyway and boo. In a sense, one part of the clack gimmick, encouraging a positive audience response, persists today with the Big Bang Theory and other broadcast sitcoms laugh tracks, a practice known sometimes as sweetening, especially if a laugh track is added to the recording of a live, in-studio audience. (laughs) Or wrestling and other live events use of canned heat pumping rowdy pre-recorded audience noise through a giant sound system to encourage the actual in-person audience to get nuts. (laughs) 
Really though, this stuff is a whole other episode for another day, so we're gonna back slowly out of this digression and get back to the matter at hand. Brandel Reese argues that applause in the creation of that collective turns someone from a spectator, a person who simply witnesses a work, into an audience member, someone who has a reaction to it. A group of people seeing something is organized twice then. First, by the work itself, you know, like they all got in the same room together, and again, by their collective reaction. So if applause indicates that you are an audience member and not simply a spectator, then that's maybe why applause can feel obligatory. By not applauding, you separate yourself from the audience. You announce yourself as a person apart. And sure enough, a collective instance of polite applause is often a sign that some group of spectators would rather look like they are audience members in respect to whomever's efforts showing appreciation to the performers who have, in an unexpected turn, delivered a mediocre display. And relatedly, Brandel Reese says that there is no accomplishment on the part of the performers without the audience members there to do their part in appreciating the performance. It's like, you know, if there's no roar of the crowd, did you really perform? But Brandel Reese theorizes also that in applauding, an audience may not be praising just performers, composers, playwrights, or Hector from accounting, but also themselves. Audiences celebrate the accomplishment of the performers, sure, but there's a way in which audiences also celebrate their own virtuosity in having chosen, witnessed, and of course, understood the work of the performers. Or maybe any given audience member is simply applauding their own graciousness in deciding to applaud. Brandel Reese writes, the admirers first celebrate the admired performance and then celebrate their admiration, applaud their own applause. And I think I agree. It's not that a fully earnest round of applause doesn't exist, but that applause is just so conspicuous. Applause may itself create enjoyment, but it is largely a way to advertise enjoyment. A performance in response to a performance, each with their own audience, which is weirdly the same audience, I guess. But like forcing yourself to smile when you're upset or how it's just impossible to be in a bad mood at Disney World, no matter how many times I've tried, and trust me, it's more than a few, I was a goth teenager, the act of applauding can seem to create the very thing that should be its precursor, approval. Applauding isn't some magical spell. It doesn't go back in time and turn some fine performance into a revelatory affair. If applause can create enjoyment, then it's enjoyment of what? Maybe ourselves deciding to enjoy, both individually and as a group. So maybe both the Romantics and the Modernists had it partially right. Applause is about advertising individual affect and a communal acknowledgement of receipt. But perhaps what they both got wrong is the idea that one solely applauds the work and responds to its contents, when in fact one may often applaud themselves as a way to bring forth from their own depths what they couldn't find in the work alone. Does this mean that the Athenian stranger was onto something too? He was afeard, remember, that loud celebratory audience noises create a kind of cabal reinforced amongst the unlearned masses that their collective response based on feelings is justified and correct. The sound of applause, amongst other noises, in response to licentious works he felt unworthy of praise, announce and to some degree create a collaboration between audience members. They become participants and not spectators, and it suggests a kind of community. And if they find agreement with one another here, may they find that agreement elsewhere? Such an extrapolation underlies an aristocrat's or 
autocrats, fear of applause, and by extension, the theater and related arts. The quiet complexity of applause, who gives it and when its length, its volume, and how it spreads or doesn't, indicates the quietness of its politics, how it does and doesn't express, maintain, and create power for an audience. But if applause is a taste of power, quietly political and subtle, complex, but still fit ever so neatly into the norms of live performance and the social conventions built around spectatorship, what happens when audiences want a taste of something stronger, want to be heard more clearly, want to act on their power more directly? There are many answers to these questions, and one of them is much, much less common than applause. It is, in fact, incidences of plaudits opposite booing. Next time, why we boo, and why we don't, and why maybe you should boo more than you do already, in addition, of course, to just getting that Athenian stranger's goat. But until then, and for now, if you are so inclined, plaudite. My name is Mike Rignetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. If you enjoy the show, you can help support it with a per-episode donation at patreon.com, a subscription service which lets you support independent creators. Patrons get access to the Reasonably Sound newsletter, music playlists, in-progress scripts, and more. Find the show at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Thank you so, so much to all of the show's patrons. It literally could not exist without you. And if you would like to support me in my many endeavors on the internet, including but not limited to Reasonably Sound, you can do that on Kickstarter's newly unveiled Drip app. You can find me at dripapp.kickstarter.com forward slash Mike You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at ReasonablySND and YouTube at Reasonably Sound. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Mike Rugnetta. Reasonably Sound's theme and act break music are by Will Stratton and visual design by Tita Tepp. Links to all of these things and more in the show notes. And hey, because you stuck around this long, how about a little update on the situation with the show? Uh, So first, it's really good to be back. (laughs) Um, I didn't intend to take a year-long break, but... Whoops. Um, Sometimes life doesn't find a way, I guess. I'm hoping that this is the start to a long productive period for Reasonably Sound. Uh, There are a bunch of things in the works that I don't want to jinx by talking about them, but uh, at the very least, I'm aiming for a new episode every two or three weeks for the foreseeable future and a few other fun surprises along the way, hopefully. I do want to be upfront, though. The schedule would get shuffled around if other work gets in the way. Um, I got to pay the bills, you know? Uh, There is a goal on the Patreon set for when I would be able to do this full-time and turn down other work in order to focus on Reasonably Sound, but we're a ways off from there. Um, Until then, I'm going to aim at slow and steady, releasing stuff that I'm proud of without burning myself out. Uh, Because, you know, I really love making this show, and I really love the people who listen to it and um, talk to me about it online. So I want to make sure I do right by the whole situation, you and the Reasonably Sound name. Okay, I'm rambling now. That's the update. Uh, Thank you for listening. I'll talk to you soon. I'll see you on the internet. Hmm. Indeed. You have concluded your series, and I understand this history you have made.